A very good morning to each one of you. Welcome to our KCF online service this morning. Before we start our service, let's look to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for yet another beautiful day in our lives. Thank you that we are able to come before you today and worship you, God, who is worthy of all our praise. Father, I pray that as our service goes about, you would bless it, Lord. You would bless each one who is listening to our service. Father, I pray that this service would be one that truly, truly glorifies your name. Thank you so much for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. What a wonderful and special day it is for the Casia family because the first Sunday of October is when we celebrate our anniversary as KCF. And uh, today is the 16th year of KCF's existence and how faithful God has been to us. God has led us in so many ways and even now in the online service we got to know so many of you and we're so so grateful and uh, we would love to sing this song, Great is your faithfulness, great is your faithfulness, Lord unto me. of God in KCF today. We would like to sing this next song, Thank You Lord. I just want to thank you Lord. I come before you today And there's just one thing that I Thank you, Lord. 
we come to our birthday and anniversary announcements, those we know of or those we got. Okay, so Nikki Benjamin, Hannah, Marquan, Evie Prakash, Shubankar, Somnath, and my mother in law celebrate in the coming week, and my mother in law turns 85. Praise God for that. And Shika and James also celebrate their anniversary next week. Shall we pray? Father God, we want to thank you so much for these dear ones that celebrate their birthdays and anniversaries, oh God. Thank you for your faithfulness in their life. We know that each of, of them would have many testimonies of your goodness and faithfulness and kindness in their life. So Lord, we just pray that you would bless them to be a blessing to others mm -hmm. in the coming days, in the coming years. We thank you, Lord, and we ask that you would lead and guide their every step. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Today is a very special day in the life of Kolkata Christian Fellowship. We call it KCF for short. Uh, some people get confused with KFC, uh, but we want to thank God for his faithfulness. It was on the 2nd of October 2005 uh, that KCF got started in a home and we rejoice in all that God has done during these years. Uh, this morning, it's our joy to be able to share with you a video. This is a video that's put together by Pastor Nilav and the team. They look after KCF South and they've put this particular video together. And as you sit back and watch this video, it's reflections of different people and their journey with KCF. If you have any questions about KCF, feel free to reach out to us and we would be most happy to give you all the details you want. We want to thank God for his faithfulness. His name be praised. Can you tell us about KCF and what it means to you? Well, when I was only eight years old is when KCF started. And as you can see, I'm a full grown woman. And you know, the one thing that I love about KCF is despite the fact that I've gone out, I've been at boarding school, I've been at university outside, KCF has always been home for me. So my heart has always been here in KCF with all of y'all. And mom, Mom and dad, actually, but mom, what was the verse that God spoke to you and then the verse that God spoke to dad when it came to KCF? Well, God spoke to me through Acts 13, 41, where it quoted Habakkuk from where God spoke to Ashok, Habakkuk 1, 5. And I will let him uh, share with you what verse that is later on. Okay, when we think about uh, KCF, we've often talked about that verse. Uh, there was a time when I was totally uncertain what God wanted in my life. And one morning as I was reading the book of Habakkuk in chapter 1 and verse 5, God said, I'm going to do something in your day that you would not believe of, even if you were told. And I wrote it down in my Bible and I said, God is giving me a promise that he's going to do something that we would not believe, even if he tells us. And that night I was sharing that verse with Mike and she began to cry. And the reason she began to cry is because God had spoken to her from the same, same verse, but from the book of Acts. And we knew God was confirming something. And 16 years ago, if somebody would have told us we would be doing this welcome for KCF 16th anniversary, we would have never believed it. But God made the promise and he kept it. He said, I will do something in your day that you would not believe of, even if you were told. And now, Dad, the next question for you is, what are the three things about KCF that have made KCF what it is today? Now, that's a difficult question because there are so many things uh, there is to share about KCF. But since Rahel only allowed me to share three, and all of you know I do alliterations all the time, I'm going to leave with you three words that I want you to think about. Number one is the scriptures. As I think back on this journey, one of the things that's held KCF together has been our love for the scriptures, for the pastors to be able to teach the word and for each one of you to really interact with the word, love the word, study the word together. KCF has been a church that's rooted and grounded on the scriptures. The second S is solidarity. You know, when we started, every Sunday was a potluck. We love to hang around with one another. And one of the things that's really, really difficult now because the pandemic is we can't meet together. Otherwise, it was just amazing, our fellowship. And even when we used to meet together, our coffee and tea time, I think most of you remember our solidarity. The scriptures 
solidarity and the third s is the s of serving people right from the beginning kcf wanted to serve people we wanted to support people serving god in different corners of west bengal and even beyond west bengal and to me um i pray that we would never ever lose those three that we'll always be a church that's focused on the scriptures that we are a church of solidarity loving one another and that we are a church that really wants to serve people and may god be glorified and one of the things that my and i are so grateful for is for the team that we worked with at kcf you know pastor nilav and the team that today leads kcf we're so grateful to god for each one of them and it's been an absolute joy for us and we pray that today and the coming years would be years filled with his blessing God has been so good. For the last 16 years he has been faithful. This is what he started and we are so grateful to him for what he has done in and through the life of KCF. One of the greatest joys that we've had is the gift of friendship of so many people who have come and become a part of KCF. And even though many of them have moved out of the city they still continue to be in touch with us they support us they pray for us and it is such a joy for us this morning to have greetings from some of them though not all of them have been able to send in their greetings but a few have sent in their greetings and this is so so special for us we are in some family thank you kcs for the online sunday school We are blessed there and God bless you too. Hello everyone. I'm Daniel and I bring greetings to you from my wife Jacqueline and my daughter Esther in Canada. One thing that I am grateful to God for KCF is this that God started the KCF through Pastor Ashok and then he raised up so many servants like Pastor Gelaf and pastor bhagirathi and so many others and god has blessed the kcf and used it to minister to so many families and it has been such a blessing to have the kcf with us every week online and i we pray as a family that god will bless the kcf and help it to grow from strength to strength god bless you all one among the many things for which we are grateful to god for kcf is the prayer support that we get and for the long time friendship and fellowship that we enjoy Psalm 1061 says give thanks to the Lord for he is good his love endures forever I'm grateful to God for Casey for the opportunity to serve in remote areas reaching out to people provide medical care setting up classes and making a difference Happy 16th anniversary to Calcutta Christian Fellowship I'm really blessed to be a part of this family and I really want to thank you for nourishing me every day with the word of God. May the good Lord bless Calcutta Christian Fellowship abundantly. Amen. Hi everyone, this is Pinaki. I'm very thankful to KCF community to helping me grow uh, spiritually and personally. When I started to attending KCF, I was very new in Christ and over the years I have experienced to walk with Jesus. I pray that God will continue to use KCF for his work. Hey everyone, the thing I'm most thankful for when it comes to KCF is how much of a family it feels like and I can't wait to one day bring my family to worship with you in person. Miss everyone so much. Happy 16th anniversary KCF. Our family has had the privilege to connect and be part of the KCF family since its inception. over the years in kolkata until 2015 and 2016 respectively and we thank god that even now in shillong we can still connect with the kcia family through the online service every sunday and we wish all the members of the kcia family the very best god bless you Hello everyone. This is Grace Mercy, ex student, Naipur, ISCB from Telangana. Kesia family, my spiritual mentor as per Second Chronicles chapter twenty verse twenty twenty one. I thank pastors, friends for your unceasing prayers, love, care, and support. Thank you. Hello everyone. I'm Kavya Teja. When I was doing my masters in Kolkata, I used to visit Kesia every Sunday. 
I do remember that I used to enter into church with empty and hopeless heart and I used to return with lot of spiritual joy and encouragement. KCF helped me to build my spiritual foundation. I am grateful to KCF for praying and caring people like us who stay far away from their hometowns and families. I pray to God that KCF will be a blessing for many people. Thank you. We are really thankful to God for giving us KCF. KCF has really helped us to strengthen our relationship with God. Hi everyone. I am Rajni. I am grateful to KCF community for helping me to grow spiritually. When I started attending KCF, I was very young in faith and over the years I have experienced a deeper walk with Jesus. I pray that God will continue to use KCF for the expansion of his kingdom. Hi KCF family, this is Henju. Thank you for the love and prayers that have supported my family and we continue to pray for each one of you in your journey with the Lord. Take care, blessings. I learned many things from Kesia. Thank you, Lord. And Kesia said that he gave me that I'm very thankful to God. I thankful to God for Kesia because of Kesia we all are here. Kesia Church is one of the foundation for my family. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Kesia. I am Renu from Haridwar. One thing I really grateful to God about Kesia is their inclusiveness, the way they have been supported me during my wedding, not only just by prayer. KCF was the first family that we knew when we were at Calcutta. Our children were a part of the Sunday school. We were a part of the fellowship, and even today we are a part of KCF. My elder son is also a part of Teens uh, Teens on Track, and we're so grateful to be uh, um, to Pastor Ashok and uh, Nilav and the team. Thank you, KCF, for being a part of our spiritual journey. Uh, first of all, uh, I am thanking God for giving me this opportunity, and uh, congratulations to Kolkata Christian Fellowship uh, for this another anniversary, which uh, God has given to you. And uh, personally, my experience in Kolkata Christian Fellowship is, uh, um, you know. Uh, I am unable to express my words, but uh, it's amazing. Uh, and uh, uh, almost I stayed in uh, Calcutta almost two years. So Graceaka introduced me uh, yeah, for this fellowship. And uh, whenever I am down, so I uh, literally encouraged by the word of God by Pastor Ashok and Auntie Mai. And thank you for your prayers. And um, and Nilavda and Sangeeta Di, uh, thank you so much for your support and all. And uh, finally, I am just thanking God uh, for this wonderful uh, anniversary which God has given to you. And uh, lastly, uh, Jarana Aunty and Bhagiradi Uncle, uh, I missed you a lot of times. But uh, you know, uh, whenever uh, I came to Calcutta, uh, I uh, really meet you all people and uh, continue pray for me and pray for my family. Uh, thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity and hearty congratulations to everyone. Hello KCF family, a big congratulations to all of us on completing 16 years. Though I am very far away from you right now, I would really want to thank God for KCF because it uh, has instilled uh, the feeling of goodness in me that I have carried on for many years now. And I've always felt like a family with it. So thank you so much. Hope you celebrate in the best way possible. We're very thankful for KCF for all that they've done during the short time we stayed in Kolkata. Everyone, the pastors, Dad, and uh, everyone has always treated us like family and made sure we were connected. And uh, we will always think of KCF wherever we go. Thank you, KCF. That was such a lovely video. Um, so nice to see so many faces we haven't seen in a long time. Thank God for his faithfulness. It was so nice to see my little niece as well. And uh, as we prepare our hearts to hear God's word, let's sing this song. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart. This is my desire.
It's hard to believe it, isn't it? Nine months of the year are over and God in his mercy and grace has brought us into the 10th month of the year 2021. This morning, before we listen to God's word, let's just quieten our hearts. Let's spend a moment to say thank you, God, for your faithfulness in my life. Let's ask him this morning, would you speak to us, Lord? We need to listen to your voice. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Let's pray together. Father, this morning, we thank you. We look back on nine months. We see the hand of your faithfulness. Your mercy has been new every morning. As sure as the dew is upon the grass, so sure has been your mercy and your faithfulness in our lives. We thank you this morning that yesterday, today and forever you have been the same. We give you thanks. And Lord, this morning as we look back, we rejoice, we praise and we bless your holy name. This morning, O oh God, as we come to you, we pray for one another. We thank you that you know each one of us by name. We thank you, O oh God, that each one of us, you have a plan for our life. And so this morning, Lord, as we begin this new month, we place our feeble hands in your righteous, powerful hands and ask that you would lead us, God. This morning, we want to ask that you would speak to us from your word. Lord, draw us to yourself. And Lord, as we prepare to celebrate around your table this morning, Holy Spirit, move in our hearts your purposes to fulfill. For we ask with a grateful heart, in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. It's been a real joy studying the book of Ezra with each one of you. And I suspect that by now, most of you remember the easy way of remembering the message of the book of Ezra. Every time I do this every week, my daughter Rahel says, Dad, you repeat yourself so many times. But my prayer is that by the time we finish the book of Ezra, you would be able to commit some of these lessons to mind. What does the E-Z-R-A remind us? They remind us of Ezra. Zerubbabel returning back and this is the account of that return. The book of Ezra is about Ezra and Zerubbabel returning back and the account of their return. What is the outline to the book of Ezra? Chapter 1 and 2 are the return under Zerubbabel. Chapter 3 is the rebuilding of the foundation of the temple. Then you come down to chapter 4, 5, and 6, and this is the resistance chapters. And those are the chapters we're going to be looking at for a couple of weeks. Then we move on to chapter 7 and 8. This is the second return. This is the return under Ezra. And for our outline, I've called it the relying chapters, because these are chapters where you see Ezra relying upon God. Chapter 9 is the rebellion chapter and chapter 10 is the repentance and restoration chapter. So I want to encourage you, my friend, I want to encourage you, those of you who've been part of this particular study, to try and commit this to memory because it's so easy to forget what we study. Try and commit it to memory so that every time you think of the book of Ezra, these thoughts will come back to your mind. Beginning from today, we want to look at chapter 4, 5 and 6. We want to look at how when the household of God begins the work at the temple, there is resistance that they face. And that resistance leads to a 15 year halt of God's work. And so we're going to look at chapter 4, 5 and 6 over the next couple of weeks. I know that many of you have told me that you are reading the book of Ezra along with me. And I suspect that if you're reading chapter 4, 5 and 6, you already have your outline for chapter 4, 5 and 6. And I wish you could share your outlines with me. But here's my outline. I'm going to be teaching you three lessons over the next three weeks. As you look at chapter 4, you learn the lesson of roadblocks to the work of God. Chapter 4 is roadblocks 
to the work of God. Chapter 5 verses 1 and 2 is revival in the work of God. Revival in the work of God. So chapter 4 roadblocks in the work of God. Chapter 5 verses 1 and 2 revival in the work of God. And chapter 5 verse 3 all the way to chapter 6 verse 22 is the reign of God over his work. God reigns over his work. So we're going to look at the roadblocks to the work of God. We're going to look at revival in the work of God. And we're going to look at a God who reigns when it comes to his work. This morning, we're going to look at Ezra chapter 4. And we're going to look at roadblocks in the work of God. When the household of Israel come back from the land of Babylon and they begin to build the temple or they face a crisis. Let me begin to read to you at chapter 4. I'm reading to you just the first part of verse 1. The Bible says, when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building the temple of the God of Israel. That's how it begins. It begins by saying, when the enemies heard that the household of Israel had come back and they were now building the temple, all the enemies get all um, disturbed and the enemies will now position themselves to kind of discourage and make it difficult for the household of God. Now, as I look at chapter 4, the roadblocks to the work of God, I want us to primarily learn two lessons this morning. One is, I want us to look at the enemy. And number two, I, wanted to, I want us to look at the excuses. There are two roadblocks to the work of God. One is the enemy. As we seek to serve God, as we seek to return and rebuild, please keep in mind, the enemy will do all he can to bring roadblocks in the work that God is wanting to accomplish in our life. Please keep in mind, we're talking about returning and rebuilding, right? And when we return and rebuild, please keep in mind, the enemy will do all he can to hamper the work of God. But the second lesson we also want to learn this morning is not only will the enemy do all he can to hinder the work of God, our own excuses will do much damage when it comes to the work of God. So we're going to look this morning at the enemy and the excuses. What I'm going to do this morning is that I'm going to journey you through chapter 4, looking at uh, different verses, looking at what the enemy does. And I'm going to encourage each one of you to spend your own time trying to read chapter 4 and allow God to speak to you in special ways. In my notes this morning, I've got seven words, seven words of what the enemy does to try and hamper the work of God. Number one, the enemy tries to use the weapon of friendship. The enemy tries to use the weapon of friendship. I want us to look at the first three verses of chapter 4 of the book of Ezra. The Bible says, When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and they said, Let us help you build because like you we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Eshardon king of us Assyria who brought us here now as you read those two verses you see that the first strategy of the enemy is the strategy of friendship when they see the household of God building the temple the enemy comes along and says Number one, we want to cooperate with you. Note what they're saying. Let's help you build this particular temple. Can we join with you? Can we cooperate with you? We'll help you in the building of the temple. The second thing that you see in this particular verse is they're also saying, hey, you know what? We've got common ground. 
we also worship your god we've got common ground let's cooperate together we've got common ground let's build a friendship together and you see the enemy is using the weapon of friendship and the 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 the, the primary desire of the enemy in these two verses is the third word i've got in my notes and that word is the word compromise the enemy wants god's children to compromise with him here he comes and says cooperate with me we have common ground but beneath that is this call to compromise so the first lesson we learn from the the way in which the enemy works is that the enemy uses friendship to try and and get the children of Israel to compromise and do things that displease God and even this morning um, I want to tell you that the enemy tries often to invite the church of Jesus Christ to make compromises. Hey, you know what? We've got common ground. Let's cooperate together. It's fine. Let's work together. Please keep in mind that the enemy uses the weapon of friendship to try and bring discouragement into the work of God. Number two, the enemy uses frustration to try and hamper the work of God. Look with me at verse 4. I'm reading the first part of verse 4. The Bible says, then the people around them set out to discourage the people of Judah. Now, as I read that particular phrase in my notes, I put down three words. Number one, this was a well-planned strategy. The enemy plans together. You know, sometimes when it comes to us doing God's work, we don't plan as diligently as the enemy plans. You see, they came to the household of Israel with this desire of friendship. We'll work with you cooperate with us but you know in verse 3 the bible says zerubbabel son of joshua and the rest of the heads of the family of israel answered you have no part with us in the building of the temple we alone will build it for the lord the god of israel as king cyrus the king of persia has commanded when the enemy realized that the friendship strategy was not working what do they now do they come up with a frustration strategy please keep in mind they are well plan the enemy plans well secondly the enemy is working in partnership look with me at that verse again the people around they all come together as a group this is a well-planned strategy this is a strategy that has partners working together and what will the strategy do the strategy will try to bring pressure on God's people so that God's people will be discouraged and God's people will stop doing the work of God and as you look at Ezra chapter 4 and as we look at our own lives even today the enemy uses the same strategy he plans well there are people who work together and what do they do they pressure us so that we would be discouraged from doing the work of the Lord so number one he uses the weapon of friendship number two he uses the weapon of frustration number three he uses the weapon of fear the enemy uses the weapon of fear look with me at verse 4 again then the people around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building the house of the Lord see you see the enemy is trying to make them afraid he uses fear so that he can cripple God's people from doing the work of God and even today the enemy uses the weapon of fear there are so many of us who are not able to fully do what God wants us to do in our lives because our hearts are filled with fear we are easily intimidated by the enemy we have fears of the future fear of the present and those fears cripple us from being able to live that life that God wants us to live there are two words I put down in my notes number one is the word threats you see they came together and they threatened the household of God they threatened them they were they were saying all kinds of things to bring fear upon them and the second word I put in my notes is the word they terrorized the house of God 
they threaten the house of God and they terrorize the house of God and they do it. They're doing all they could to make the household of God afraid so that the work of God can be stopped. So as you're looking at chapter four, number one, the enemy uses the strategy of friendship. Number two, the enemy uses the strategy of frustration. He tries to frustrate God's children. Number three, the enemy uses the, the weapon of fear. He tries to make God's children afraid. Number four, the enemy uses the strategy of finances. The enemy uses the strategy of finances. Look with me at verse 5. The Bible says in the first part of verse 5, they bribed officials to work against them and to frustrate their plans. They bribed the officials to work against them and frustrate their plans. As I look at that particular verse, I put down three words in my notes. Number one, they bribed people right and one of the things that the enemy does is that he uses money to not only oppose the work of God but oftentimes even buy God's children so that God's children are not able to do his work so in my notes I put on number one he bribes people number two he tries to buy people with money he uses money he uses finances to try and buy people oftentimes there are people on the outside who've been bribed to work against the work of God but oftentimes I've also also seen even within the church how money has corrupted the church from being what the church is able to be what a believer is able to be how money has corrupted that believer from being the kind of person he wants to be please keep in mind money itself is not bad it's a gift from God but the evil one uses finances oftentimes to cripple the work of God he bribes people he buys people and thirdly according to this verse he tries to block the work of God by the use of finances so if you're journeying with me to the book of Ezra chapter 4 you realize he uses friendship to try and block the work of God number two he uses the weapon of frustration to try to frustrate the work of God number three he uses the weapon of fear to try and cripple the work of God number four he uses the weapon of finances to try and stop the work of God number five please keep in mind that he is fervent in what he does the enemy is fervent in what he does look with me as I read for you verse 5 the Bible says they bribed um, the officials to work against them and to frustrate their plans and then note what the Bible says during the entire reign of Cyrus king of Persia down to the reign of Darius king of Persia you know what the Bible says is that they were fervent and sometimes I think we need to learn from the enemy we give up easily but the enemy is fervent. This is a diligent enemy and this is a determined enemy. A diligent and determined enemy working against the household of God. You know, recently I was reading about the, uh, the alligator sla snapping turtle. I don't know if you've heard about the alligator snapping turtle. The alligator snapping turtle is one of the larger turtles. And you know, the alligator snapping turtle has a very unique way in which it gets its spray. You know what it does? It just goes to the, the bottom of uh, the water and lies really still. And once it lies still, the alligator um, 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 snapping turtle opens its mouth. And once it opens its mouth, it sticks out its tongue. And apparently in the corner of its tongue um, or in the tip of its tongue are some very cute little uh, little growths and what does this turtle do it it keeps just only moving that particular tongue around and as it moves the tongues around tongue around you know what happens um, fish fish gets attracted and fish come right for that tongue and guess what happens the turtle simply closes its mouth and the rest is history 
And oftentimes, the enemy, that's the kind of strategy. We work against an extremely deceptive, destructive, well-planned, um, an enemy that's really, really seeking to destroy and seeking to break the work of God. I want to just share with you this morning, the encouragement, how, however, is that in Christ, this enemy is defeated. And you and I are called to be more than conquerors. But as you look at the book of Ezra, here are the strategies of the enemy. He uses the friendship strategy. Strategy. He uses the frustration strategy. He uses the fear strategy. He uses the financial strategy. He is fervent in attacking God's people. Number six, he uses the falsehood strategy. He uses the falsehood strategy. I want you to read verses six down to verse 22. I'm not going to read all of these verses, but as you read these verses, you realize that the enemy will use falsehood to try and stop the work of God. Let me just read for you a couple of verses. Look with me at verse 6. The Bible says, At the beginning of the reign of Xerxes, they lodged, note the Bible says, an accusation against the people of Judah and Jerusalem. I'd like you to come down with me. Let me read for you verse 12. The Bible says in verse 12, this is the letter they are writing to the king. They are saying um, to King Artaxerxes. And then if you're looking at verse 12, they are saying, The king should know that the people who came up to us from you have gone to Jerusalem. And then note what the Bible says. They are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. They are restoring the walls and repairing the foundations. Note, this is an absolute lie. Because at this particular point, all that God's children are trying to do is they're trying to build the temple. They're not building the walls. They're not building the city. They are trying to build the temple. But guess what's happening? They are lying to the king and saying, you know what? This rebellious people, they're building this rebellious city. They're restoring the walls. They're putting up the foundations. And this is going to be a disaster for you. Please keep in mind that the enemy uses falsehood. He tries to defame God's children. He tries to deceive people with his lies and ultimately his desire is to destroy people. So write down those three words in your notes. He tries to defame people. He tries to deceive people and he tries to destroy people with falsehood. So the enemy uses the friendship strategy. He uses the frustration strategy. He uses fear strategy. He is fervent in the way he attacks God's people. He he uses falsehood as a weapon and finally he uses force. The seventh uh, word that I put down in my notes is that he uses force to try and hamper the work of God. Look with me in your Bible verses 23 and 24 of Ezra chapter 4. As soon as the copy of the letter of King Artaxerxes was read to Rahum and Shish, uh, Shimshai, the secretary, and their associates, they went immediately to the Jews in Jerusalem. And what does the Bible say? The Bible says they compelled them by force to stop the work of God. Two words in my notes. Number one, they bullied the people of God and they were brutal when it came to stopping the work of God. So as you look at Ezra chapter 4, um, we're looking at roadblocks to the work of God. And one of the things that each one of us needs to keep in mind as we think about returning and rebuilding our lives is that we have a real enemy. And this enemy is going to do all he can to try and stop the work of God. This enemy is going to do all he can to discourage. And if he can, to try and destroy God's plan for your life and my life. Please keep those seven words in mind. He uses the friendship strategy. He uses the frustration strategy. He uses the fear strategy. He uses the financial stra finances strategy. He is fervent. Every day he keeps on and on bugging us. He uses the falsehood strategy and he uses the false strategy. He does all he can to seek to stop the work of God. And sadly, as you look at Ezra chapter 4, and if you look with me at that last verse, verse 24, the Bible says, Thus the work on the house of God in Jerusalem 
came to a standstill until the second year of King Darius, king of Persia. So the work of God came to a standstill for 15 long years. Why? Because the enemy worked against the household of God. And this morning, I want to just remind you that the enemy will do all he can to destroy and to discourage and to stop us from doing what God desires us to do in our lives. Just this last week in my morning walk, I was praying specifically about certain things. And as I was praying about certain things, I was getting really upset about certain things that were happening. And I was saying, God, how could this happen? This should not happen, God. And I was really praying in my walk and saying, God, I want you to do this and I want you to do that. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit began to speak to me. And the Holy Spirit said to me, Ashok, you're so distracted. You know, you're distracted with what's happening immediately around you. And you are actually reacting to what is happening around you. But please keep in mind that this is not the problem. The problem is that there is an enemy behind all of this. And he's the one who is doing all of this to somehow discourage and if he could stop the work of God. So become a person who is wise in your prayer. And I thank the Holy Spirit that morning saying, Lord, I want to thank you for opening my eyes because it's so easy to be distracted with what is happening immediately around us and take our eyes away from the enemy that is seeking to destroy God's work. There are so many times, even in the body of Jesus Christ, small relationships, relationship problems, small misunderstandings, stop us from doing what God wants us to do please keep in mind the enemy is so smart he uses all of these to somehow stop the work of God so please keep in mind if you're going through one of those struggles to stop before him and say God I want to thank you this morning that I am more than a conqueror in Jesus Christ. I want to thank you for the weapons you've given us as believers, weapons that can actually tear down strongholds, God. Help us this morning to be sensitive of the work of the enemy and Lord, to focus upon you and to be victorious in our lives. You are more than a conqueror in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. There were roadblocks because of the enemy. Secondly, there were roadblocks because of the excuses. Yes, there were enemies and those enemies did all they could to make it difficult for the household of God. But as you read the prophet Haggai, you realize that it was not just the enemies that were the cause for these roadblocks. The, the cause for these roadblocks were also the excuses that God's children uh, were bringing before God. Look with me at Haggai chapter 1. Turn with me in your Bible to Haggai chapter 1. And I want us to look at the first four verses very quickly in Haggai chapter 1. Haggai chapter 1 verse 1, the Bible says, In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah and Joshua son of Jehozadak the high priest. Note in verse 2 the Bible says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Excuse number one, procrastination. Oh, the time has not come for the rebuilding of God's house. You know what happened? They faced opposition. And because of that opposition, now the household of God became slothful. I put down two words in my notes. The first word is the word slothful. They became lazy. Now is not the time. We'll do it tomorrow. We'll do it day after tomorrow. We'll do it the day after that. And guess how many days has gone by? 15 years have gone by. Excuses. Procrastination of God's people is one of the biggest enemies to God being able to accomplish his work in our life. Our excuse of procrastination. I'll do it tomorrow. The time is not today. Slothfulness. I've shared this story before. A friend of mine had a puncture in his car tire when he was going to work one morning. He was rushing out. There was a puncture in his tire. He got it fixed, rushed off to work. And as he was going to his work, he said, I've got to fix my spare tire. But he said to himself, you know what? I'm in a hurry today. I'm going to just go to my office on my way back. I'll do it on the way back. He said, listen, I've got to go out for dinner tonight. Let me do it tomorrow. The next day he said, okay, I'll do it day after tomorrow. And this went on and on until finally he completely forgot that his spare tire was punctured. 
And then on a very, very rainy day, he was returning back home and he was driving down one of the most crowded um, flyovers. And as he was dri driving down one of these really crowded flyovers, all of a sudden his car began to wobble and he realized that his tire was punctured. And the moment he realized that his tire was punctured, his heart almost stop beating because he realized that his spare tire was in worse situation than the tire that just got punctured because for several months it had it had lain in in the back of his car having not been fixed you see procrastination slothfulness that was the problem with god's people the excuse number one was their procrastination they had become slothful not only had they become slothful they even spiritualized their procrastination oh the time has not come you see with the right time at god's right time we'll be able to build the temple you know we're waiting upon god we're praying we're seeking his holy face please keep in mind that sometimes we even spiritualize our procrastination i'm waiting for the right time today is the right time today is the day of salvation today god wants his children to be hard working today god wants his children to go out there and live for him today god wants his children to be more than conquerors as you're looking at the household of god as we're thinking about roadblocks there are roadblocks because of the enemy but there are also roadblocks because of our own excuses excuse number one procrastination excuse number two the people were preoccupied excuse number two the people were preoccupied look with me as i read for you verses three and four the bible says and the word of the lord came through the prophet haggai is it time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while the while this house remains in ruins you see they are saying the time for building god's house isn't come you know why because there's so much of opposition around but guess what's happening? They're building their own houses. They're building their own little palaces. You see what has happened to the people of God? Two things have happened. Number one, their priority has changed. When they, when they came back from the land of their bondage, their priority was, let's finish this temple. And so what did they do? The very first thing they did was they put the foundation of the temple. Then there were little problems that came. When those problems came, they decided, no, 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 we're not going to do the temple. Now the time is not right. But guess what happened? Their priority changed. Now their priority is no longer God. Their priority is themselves. Their priority is building their own homes. And that's what God is saying. Is it time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while the house, while this house of mine remains in ruins? You see, their priorities change. And when your priorities change, your pursuits change. Their priorities change. And when their priorities change, their pursuits change. You see, as you look at the household of God, they hit these roadblocks. Why do they hit these roadblocks? On the one hand, they were facing the enemy. On the other hand, they were dealing with excuses. And both of these caused such terrible roadblocks. And the work of God was stopped for 15 long years. As we think about the enemy, let me just repeat those seven lessons. He uses the weapon of friendship. He uses the weapon of frustration. He uses the strategy of fear. He uses finances to stop the work. He is fervent day in and day out. He uses falsehood and he uses force. We have a real enemy. On the other hand, think of the excuses. Procrastination, preoccupied. And this morning as we think about God's word, as we think about returning and rebuilding, let's look at our own lives. Please keep in mind, the enemy is real, but God wants us to be more than a conqueror. And we can come to him this morning and say, Lord, help me. I want to thank you that the enemy is real, but Lord, I am more than a conqueror in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe this morning, there's somebody who's making excuse after excuse after excuse. You're saying this message is just for me. I am procrastinating. I am preoccupied. God, this morning, I want to come to you. I want you to remove the roadblocks in my life. And I want to truly honor you to bring you praise, glory, and worship. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. As every eye is closed and every head is bowed this morning, I want you to think about the message of this morning. The enemy is real. He uses friendship. He tries to frustrate the work. 
He tries to bring fears into our heart. He uses finances to work against God's work. He is fervent. He uses falsehood against God's work and he uses force. Is there somebody this morning, you're going through such discouragement and maybe this morning that discouragement has taken your eyes off the enemy and you're focusing on the immediate struggles of your life. This morning, would you thank God, thank you Holy Spirit for reminding me that there is an enemy and that Lord, you have given us weapons that can tear down strongholds. This morning, we want to hold on to you. And this morning, is God speaking to one of you? Are you always making excuses, procrastinating, doing tomorrow what you have to do today? Is there somebody this morning who's saying, God, I'm so preoccupied. At one time, I was so excited about your work, but now I'm preoccupied with my own house, with my own making money this morning. God, thank you for speaking to me. Father God, this morning, we want to thank you for reminding us from Ezra chapter 4 that, Lord, there were roadblocks in the work that the household of Israel were doing because of the enemy and because of their own excuses. And even today, we realize, Lord, that the same two struggles cause roadblocks in what you want to do in our lives. We thank you for reminding us this morning that, Lord, the enemy is defeated at the cross of Calvary. And God, we fight no longer for victory. We fight from the victory of Jesus Christ. We are more than conquerors. We thank you, Lord, for reminding us this morning that we need to bring our excuses to you this morning and say, Lord, help us to make no excuses to be diligent in the way we live for you. Lord, as we prepare ourselves to celebrate around the table, we pray that, Lord, you would bring to remembrance your word again and again, that we would be obedient to you, that we would honor you, that we would glorify you. We thank you again, Lord. We commit the rest of this service into your hands. For we ask with a grateful heart, in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. As we prepare to celebrate around the Lord's table, as every eye is closed and every head is bowed, let me read for you these words of the Scriptures. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Father, this morning we want to thank you that Jesus' body was broken, his blood was shed, that we might have life and life everlasting. This morning, God, we thank you for the reminder of the scriptures that this is a moment when, Lord, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to search our lives. If there, there is unconfessed sins, if there is bitterness, if there is brokenness in relationships, that this would be a time of confession, that we would set our lives right before you, knowing fully well that when we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We thank you this morning for your faithfulness. Lord, bless us in this time as we celebrate around your table. For we ask with a grateful heart, in Jesus' name, Amen. 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 As we prepare ourselves to celebrate around the Lord's table, we're going to sing together the first stanza of that beautiful hymn, On a Hill Far Away. <laughs> On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. 
So I cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for the cross on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and having given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As we sing the next stanza, I'm going to ask that you would pass the bread around in your home so that we can partake of the bread together. Oh, that old rugged cross so despised by the world has a wondrous traction for me for the dear lamb of god left his glory above to bear it to dark calvary so i cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last i lay down i will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown Jesus said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Shall we partake of the bread together? The Bible says in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. As the cup is passed around in your homes, well, let's prepare our hearts as we sing the next stanza in the old rugged cross stained with blood so divine. In the old rugged cross stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to pardon and sanctify me. So I cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling. For a crown. Jesus said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Shall we partake of the cup together? Father, this morning we want to thank you for the finished work of Calvary. We thank you that, Lord, in Jesus, we are more than conquerors. We thank you this morning, O God, that Satan has been defeated. And that, Lord, we do not need to fight for victory. We can fight from the victory of Jesus Christ. And so, God, even in light of your word this morning, we thank you that the enemy has already been defeated. You want us to be more than conquerors. And so, Lord, give us grace not to make excuses. And Lord, may our lives bring you honor and praise. Be glorified in us, be glorified through us. For we ask with a grateful heart, in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. As we close our service this morning, I want to request wherever you are, if you would stand, let's sing our last stanza of that song together to the old rugged cross, I will ever be true.
Cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown now we pray that the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with each one of us, both now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>